day of the Bassmasters Classic. Yeah. If anybody thinks that was an accident, they are smoking dope. Help a dang your mind! Bass fishing was born in the southern states, which is why in 2004, it made perfect sense to take this sports world championship into the heart of the Carolinas. Charlotte, North Carolina was a wonderful host city. We've got a huge fan base there. A lot of bass members, uh, they're very passionate about their fishing. They're very enthusiastic, you know, about sports period. You know, we've got major league, you know, baseball, football, basketball, NASCAR, we've got it all there. And they were real, you know, excited to get fishing. Carolinas, you're in the heart of the bass belt, you know, so when you got there, uh, you, you knew you were around fans that, that knew the sport and loved the sport. I thought Charlotte was awesome. I mean, everybody from the community, to the facilities, to the fans. It was a great classic. Charlotte was an excellent place to hold a classic. It was, uh, it provided the kind of fishery that they needed to test the best, which is what the Bassmaster Classic is all about. Great host city. I thought we were treated very well. I thought the fans on the water were excellent. I know when I was fishing the spot up the river the first day, I had a pretty large entourage of boats with me, and they'd just go nuts when I'd catch one. It was a neat classic, and in fact, we were on a good lake, but it was small enough that people could get to us. New Orleans, when I mean, you had an hour and a half boat ride if you wanted to follow somebody, and that was just that, that was undoable. This here, we were all pinned up in one little happy circle. We weren't going nowhere, and the fans were great. They come out and drove. We returned to our roots by by going back to a lake. The fan floating fan galleries that we used to have back in the early 90s returned. I think that adds a tremendous uh, element of excitement to it. Not only that, but it puts the fans more in touch with the uh, with the anglers. You know, not unlike you have it at a golf tournament. Unbelievable. Quinn and myself were laughing the first day of the Classic. I probably had 30 or 40 with me, and Quinn probably had 50 or 60 with him, and we actually crossed running in the creek. I'm running in, and Quinn's running out. It looks like some kind of kamikaze suicide mission. You know, we got space boats colliding, people running. I actually dipped off in the pocket, and I was like laughing at him. It's over, but I think it just shows where we're headed. Where's this Port Gordon's going to the top? The Bassmaster Classic has always had its share of media hype, but nothing would compare to the onslaught of attention that descended on Charlotte, North Carolina. 2004 will be remembered as such a breakthrough year for the sport, and, and primary reason being that, that ESPN elevated the sport to a major league level with their coverage. The coverage at the Classic was mind-boggling, absolutely mind-boggling. I really think we'll look back at this Classic and say, this was another stepping stone to get our sport in the right direction. It's elevated the sport to a level that I never thought I would see it. Rise For your primetime coverage, day-long coverage, a lot of live coverage, it was the first time a fishing fan could actually have some idea of what was going on in a fishing tournament during the entire last few days. Bassmasters, always entertaining. No bobbers, please. <laughs> <laughs> you know what that is? That's the smell of money. Mwah! All right, now bring him into the end. Oh, there's nothing more thrilling than a man walking into an arena with a big sack of fish. And, and the neat thing that I saw happen out of this classic before any other classic was the fact I had a lot of people come up to me that weren't fishing fans or have never known anything about our sport. Saw it on ESPN, sort of fell in love with it. I heard, I didn't really seen it all. I, I've heard from my friends and relatives that yeah, I was, I, was on, I was on TV quite a bit. <laughs> I've had people calling me that I've not seen in 15, 20 years, you know, saying, hey, we've seen you on TV, you know, that I never even thought they would watch anything like that. I think it's got a lot to do with Dave. Now, TV can actually air the emotions of myself or Marty God, Stone or Skeet Reese when you're winning and when you're losing. Before, that's never been shown. I don't care if it's in football or if it's in tennis or if it's in golf. 
when you see the man on top no. do his deal, no. be successful, no. display some emotions, you realize you are watching not only a superhero in a one way, you're watching a human. You're watching a guy that's played it at its greatest. And I think that's why you have so many fans of these Williams. You got so many new fans stepping out there that like Ike and Ellie, Dean Rohan, Skeet Reese. They're getting a chance to see you play it at the best, yes. bottom and top. I think we're going to create a following starting with this classic. And we've set a precedent. We put the ball pretty dog on high. We're the most accessible athletes in the world right now. Oh, this guy looks like a pirate. Dude, he's the coolest person in the world. I bought you these for tomorrow! <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks, man. You get guys with me like, hey, gee, what do you think about this Jackson Quinn? Dude, he's the coolest person in the world. That's right. Different. Got the bling bling going, but it's a great difference. Oh, this guy looks like a pirate. He looks like a modern day pirate with the earrings and the ponytail. That's the side of fishing that's never been brought in. Now you got this guy standing there fishing for a hundred grand with a ponytail and earrings. <laughs> and this little uh, look upon him, you're thinking, my gosh. Are those 14 karat gold or 24? You know, on your Is that a real one karat diamond in your ear? Hey, if you're going to wear six earrings, if you're going to own the BASS record for the most earrings in a tournament, you're going to have to have a sense of humor. And Jason understood that uh, early on. I bought you these for tomorrow! <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks, Fish. You know, when I first came and started fishing, I think a lot of the guys kind of shied away from me. Like, you know, who's this dude coming in here with all these earrings and stuff? But now, it doesn't bother them at all. You know, I get along with everybody, and everybody approaches me, and, you know, I'm a very approachable guy. Everybody likes Jason. Everybody supports him. Everybody respects him. And he's one of the young studs in this business. We haven't seen the best of him yet. Good fish. Good fish, sir. Jason Quinn, number one, I think was the heaviest pre-classic favorite at least in the two decades I've covered classic. Hands down. That's it. We're going to see if we can catch a big bag and win this thing and put the hometown jinx to rest. Incredible amount of pressure for Jason and I. I always have felt sorry for the local pros at the Bassmaster Classic. They're obviously going in with the expectations of the crowd carried with them, and that, that's a lot of pressure. I never got nervous until we crossed Buster Wood Bridge that first morning of the tournament, and we seen all the spectator boats waiting on us to blast off. That's when I got nervous. Up into the tournament time, you know, fishing the tournament on my home waters, wasn't nervous at all. What Jason didn't understand and had no way of understanding is there is no bigger bullseye in this sport than to go into a classic as a hometown fan. The odds are always against the hometown guy. I mean, all the hype, the media pressure going into the event, the extra people following him. Everybody thought he was probably going to be a shoe in He's thinking about that, too. And how many people am I letting down if I don't win on my home body of water? That's a tough deal. He had the weight of the world on his shoulders. Everyone there, except for the competitors there, thought he was going to win or should win home lake. Local favorite. Well, the odds were stacked against him just because he was a hometown favorite. I mean, if, if, if this was not the classic, you know, I'd bet the mortgage on Jason Quinn on it because he does know that lake. He is a guide on that lake. He's a great fisherman. Without all the extra baggage that comes with being the hometown favorite in the classic, I think Jason Quinn wins that classic. Hundreds of boats followed Jason throughout the tournament, and he handled it with statesmanship, diplomacy. You know, the way Jason handled Wilder was phenomenal. Even to the crazy guy going out there doing donuts around this boat, I would have come unglued. I would have absolutely, they would have had to come get me. Hold this beard a minute. On the last day of the tournament, you know, he, he's fishing in a cove, he pulls out of a cove, he's, he's doing everything in a gentlemanly fashion, but apparently this huge flotilla of boats, 30 or 40 boats following him, somebody threw a wave up on a dock, and the homeowner who owned the dock apparently got um, a little more irritated by this than most sane people would have been, I think. Road rage comes to the lake, and that's what happened with the you know, situation with uh, Jason. Uh, we've had run-ins with him for the last 10, 12 years. 
You know, he he thinks that code's for him and his boyfriends to ski around it. And he doesn't like the fishermen coming in there. Sorry, partner, but I'm not the type of person you are. We're on public waters here. You know, he's got a fishing license just like the other guy. He's got just as much right to uh, okay. to be there. This, guy's, okay. this guy was out of line. Appreciate it. Big time. But the cool thing was, there was a couple of our finest North Carolina Highway Patrolmen off duty out there watching that and then experiencing. And they sort of had him cuffed and stuff before it even got to be that big of a deal. So he messed with the wrong man at the wrong time with the wrong folks following him. Get him. Jason handled it like a pro. He never missed a beat, and it didn't really upset him for the remainder of the tournament. Here's the deal about our classics. We're on public waters. It's accessible to everyone. You can get up close and personal with us when we fish these things. We're the most accessible athletes in the world right now. But we can't police the crowd. The crowd has to police themselves. And they did a fine job of it. And that's what I was all about. Get her done! <laughs> all right, never give up! Huge first day. He took a page out of NASCAR. You either win or wreck. He knew he wasn't going to win, so by God, he's mad. He got himself DQ'd. You know what? <laughs> Brothers always one up in everybody. Hello. I think I can be calling. Um, kind of had a scripted plan of some things that he was probably going to do. And, you know, when he caught that big fish on the first day, and classic number two, here I come. I thought that was that'd be good. You know, it's just, he's going he's to do something like that. And to have a start like that, you know, I, I believed it was possible. And I believed if I can get four or five bites a day, it would, it would win the classic. I know I can nearly caught a big fish the first day of the tournament, and where he caught that fish, there's never been anything that big swimming by that place. You know, that's just a place that, you know, goes overlooked. Nobody fishes a lot. A lot of people dislike the, the Ike antics, if you will. By the same token, a lot of other people really like him. He's good for the sport, whether you like his, uh, his performances are not a huge fish. Ike had a tough road in 2004. He, he stumbled. Huge first day. Guy's a little Nike show. Getting, getting the corporate world going. Stunk it up with the best of them. He took a page out of NASCAR. NASCAR's golden rule, you either win or wreck. He knew he wasn't going to win, so by God, he ran. He got himself dq His decision to fish the off-limits area and his subsequent disqualification were all highly scrutinized for one reason or another. Ike is, is known as one to uh, push the limit as far as it can go. A tough call. Did he know he was fishing an off-limits area? The only person on the planet that can answer that question is Mike Iconelli. There's been a lot of rumors floating around that it was publicity stunt, that I staged that because I didn't have any fish. To be honest, I'd love to tell you it was a publicity stunt, but, but honestly, it wasn't. I mean, I, I made a legitimate mistake. If anybody thinks that was an accident, they are smoking dope. He, by God, just went into that place just as he knew it better than anybody, and he won. He got Nike and all his other sponsors on TV. Is it a marketing point? If it was, it was very intelligent. He got more airtime than he got leading it that day. You know, and this is all about impressions and images. This is not, this is not 20 years ago, a bunch of, a bunch of bubbles out there eating moon pies and Twinkies and drinking cold beers trying to make a living. Well, all these, there's probably 15 or 20 guys that's making 200 to half a million dollars a year on contract. They know how to make money. And sometimes making money is just getting on TV, your impressions. That's what I get paid to do. That's what Ike gets paid to do. Maybe he did know it, man. I didn't. I mean, it's it's funny. You know, it's funny because I like to think I was that smart, you know, to do something like that from a marketing standpoint. Now, he might tell a different story. I know him too good. He's too smart. I was just 
I just made a stupid mistake, you know, and that's the bottom line. Realistically, you know, it, it's a great story. You know, it's something to think about. It's kind of a cool deal. Like, well, maybe he did that. Maybe he's sharp enough to figure out he's going to get no press or he's going to get a bunch of press by getting DQ'd. But in reality, I just don't think he'd do that. I, I just don't have that feeling that he would. And I think he just messed up. I think he just messed up big time. Mike Iconelli's day ended with a disqualification. And much like the next day started with a bit of a sting. The great lost You know, he and his observer had a lot of fun with some hornets. He was stung a lot. Ah, oh, that's a little bit overkill. You know, it's just a couple of these things. Good God, Ike. If you wasn't such a wimp, they wouldn't hurt so bad. Well, you know, after having to listen to all that yelling that he does on TV, it was kind of nice to see him yelling for a reason. Beware of wasps. One thing about it, he didn't stop. That's the character of Mike Iaconelli. And I'm talking about, we're not talking about these little bitty bees that you see, you know, out on the farm. We're talking about some hornets, you know, some big guys. You know, and if he could cast, he would have never been up in them trees anyway. That's how I look at it. Y'all ain't got to tell him I said that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I heard that uh, he was attacked by killer bees at the Classic. And uh, once again, the press swarmed all over it. We got this column in the production trailer. And we get this call that Mike Iaconelli has been stung by hornets. And you would have thought it was Apollo 13 and Mission Control when, you know, they had the explosion. You know, see, I mean, everybody was going crazy. Once again, the brother was on there with all his sponsors blinging him. So what do you say? I was getting paid. It was another moment. It wasn't, it wasn't all it meant up to me, but it made for good TV to do that. Fisherman's motto, be a hoe or be po. I mean, the brother's working it. He didn't win the tournament, but if you're a professional bass fisherman and the purpose is to gain visibility for your sponsors, I guess he hit a home run, didn't he? That's horrible. It's horrible. If we would have carried PB and J, we would have starved to death. <laughs> they kind of eat the low fish. <laughs> they kind of eat the food. Man. No, I said next time you went to class, we celebrated at my house. Barbecue chicken, cold beer, french fries, and macaroni and cheese. the scales with a limit for Dean Rojas, the all-time BASS record holder. Watching where the weight needs 12.15. Nine pounds, one ounce. Takahiro Amore, your 2004 Simco Bassmaster Classic champ. Takahiro Omari had reached the pinnacle of his sport capturing the Bassmaster Classic title. Getting there would involve many hardships and sacrifices, but nothing could stop the dream or the man from the land of the rising sun. When he was 15 years old, somewhere around that range, he knew what he wanted to do. He wanted to come over here and be a professional angler. And he worked, and he saved, and he worked, and he saved, and he finally got over here. The story of Takahiro Mori is, is really like something you'd read in a history book. It's, it's like uh, the immigrants that we used to read about who come to the United States with, with nothing. And they come here on a dream and a prayer, and they do incredible things. Well, yeah, I first met Taki in 1992 when, when he came and joined the, the Invitational Trail, and you know the kid didn't know five words of English. And, and you know, if you don't know him, you just don't know what you're missing. He's such a great guy. His English is a little whacked out, you know. He says, well, but warm. But I think that's funny. He said, well, quack bait. And I think that's funny. But I like that, because, see, I don't speak good Japanese. Came here with, with no support system, no kind of support system, but he had a dream. Well, I was 21 years old. I had a lot of dream. And uh, I was young. I was endless energy. And everything I see was uh, fun. I, was, uh, I really had a lot of desire to want to be the foundation. Tio was like, paid the price, dude. He slept in the truck, he defied all odds. You know, this is a guy that had no prayer. Nobody even dreamed he would make it. The big joke in Japan for a long time was Takahiro was always known as the hungry fisherman. Everyone's was brother flat and busted. It's hard to get checked in a tournament back then for me. So I have to go back 
Japan to work. Then I come back here during the season and go back to Japan. When he come over here, there's like nobody even considered him. And this guy stuck it out, dude. He sacrificed, he sacrificed. And he comes to the class, he, he dreamed it, he planned it, and he wanted it. Takahiro went from, you know, driving from Texas to Alabama, sleeping in a rental car, not knowing any English, to living the American dream. Got a Bassmasters Classic champ, Takahiro Omari! After his classic victory, Takahiro Omari journeyed back to his homeland, taking with him his honor, the classic trophy, and two unlikely companions. The trip, it just, it never stopped. It was a, it was a um, seven day adventure. Every night we had a dinner. That's horrible, it's horrible. If we wouldn't have carried PB and J, we would have starved to death. I lost 13 pounds in eight days. They kinda eat the little fist. <laughs> they kinda eat the food. <laughs> No, all of my favorite food, Judd and those guys cannot eat. And T.O.'s eating crap raw and brains. Uh -uh. No, I said next time you went to class, we celebrated at my house. Barbecue chicken, cold beer, french fries, man, macaroni and cheese. But I had two meals, but everything on that plate either stared at me, winked at me, walked off the plate, or had fins. All the good food over there, those guys cannot eat. I feel sorry for that. <laughs> Talk to the disgusting stuff I've ever seen in my life. It was absolutely the one of the most tiring trips I've ever been on. Dude, they work us in the ground. It was like 37, 39, 50 hours. I don't know before I even got to go to bed when I left home. First day we get there, we stopped at Popeye's, which is their equivalent of Bass Pro Shop. We got Japanese media, we got cameras, everybody waiting for Takahiro to get off. It was a great experience for Marty and I because we got to step back, uh, you know, and watch this guy in his own home country, what it meant to him. When I get back to Japan with classic trophy, I was proud just myself and uh, proud what I did last, you know, last 12, 13 years. Basically, I have been looking for that trophy all my life. and. Uh, I uh, really, really, just, uh, I really proud of myself, and uh, I want to show a lot of stuff for all my friends and teachers. My, my mom, my brother, sister said, hey, I did it. <laughs> he got to see his mother, be with his family, his people, you know, the people that respected him and admired him the most. I think it was very emotional for him to go back home, and it was kind of like that to me and Marty to watch him. I mean, it was huge to see these people flock to him. If you're a Japanese citizen and you saw somebody do what he's done, and I'm not just talking about it from a fishing perspective. I'm talking about it from, you know, school hard knocks all the way to being the top of your sport. He accomplished something I think is pretty major. He should be a national hero. And my personal opinion is he's a great representative of the sport. The last four or five years, we've had great classic representation. And I don't pull anything away from Dr. Hero. He's just every, every, every bit as good as anybody else. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports.